Okay, so our topic was applications of diffusion for solar cells. Solar cells have a pretty wide variety of applications. Uh, since we as a society are beginning to move more towards renewable types of energy, solar energy is only becoming more popular in our everyday products. Essentially, solar cells function by directly transforming energy from the sun into electricity. We'll go a bit more into detail on this a little bit later. Um, to reiterate, solar energy has a wide field of applications. Some day-to-day -day applications include powering your calculator, lighting, powering road signs and traffic lights. Um, solar energy can also be seen in some more obscure scenarios. This includes space applications such as satellites and telescopes. Um, it makes a great form of energy for space due to its close proximity to the sun and there's also no atmosphere to hinder its ability to harness energy from the sun. Diffusion plays a large role in the design and manufacturing of solar cells. Solar cells are typically made with a silicon base, since it's abundant on Earth. However, silicon has a low absorption coefficient and conductivity in pure form. Therefore, diffusion is used to optimize both properties when making solar cells. To increase the silicon's ability to absorb photons from the sunlight, the material with a high coefficient of absorption is doped into the surface of the silicone, allowing the cell to be more readily taken the energy from the sun. This surface layer acts as an emitter, which takes energy from the sun and transfers it into the silicon base. To increase the conductivity, diffusion doping of N and P-type materials is used to alter the number of valence electrons, which creates an electrical potential difference, allowing the energy from the sun to be quickly sent out to in electrical current to create power. The fusion is very important in being able to create solar cells cheaply because we can use the silicon base and simply alter its properties where needed to produce an efficient solar cell. Now Joe will go more into on the aspects of diffusion. So some general things to take into consideration with diffusion is many things diffuse in materials such as heat and energy, but current is the most important in a semiconductor Dopants are what give cells this conductivity. These dopants diffuse throughout the cells and are introduced, or when introduced to their charge, whether it's positive or negative. When these dopants diffuse throughout a solar cell to create a current that must be accounted for in solar cell production. More specifically, light can have a higher intensity on different parts of the solar cells, and this disparity in intensity can create differences in concentrations of electrons. This causes diffusion, which is the spreading of electrons from more concentrated to less concentrated areas, and that creates a current. The diffusion current is then, and that can then be passed to whatever someone would want to use the solar cell to power. So when we're looking at our particular examples, we need to look at some relevant calculations or graphics that correspond to the solar cell. So for starters, we'd look at non-steady state diffusion, which is more common than its contrary steady state diffusion. In short, it is when the diff diffusion flux and concentration gradient are time varying, meaning there's not constant diffusion of atoms or particles. One side of the diffusion process will have more than more substance than the, than the entire other side. This would deal is known as fixed second law. Non-steady state diffusion is incredibly impactful in solar cells due to the unpredictability of photons striking the panels. However, this unpredictability leads to current flow and in turn power. Influence diffu for influencing diffusion, there are several aspects that influence the diffusion of particles. For starters, the temperature has a major impact on the system as a whole. A higher temperature results in greater diffusion coefficient. There are also two categories of diffusion to discuss, self-diffusion and interdiffusion. While self-diffusion is not very impactful on the instance of solar cells, interdiffusion is. Interdiffusion is used in the creation of the N-type and P-type semiconductors. Without interdiffusion, the entire system would be far less efficient and the energy output would decrease tremendously as a result. The equation to the right of the influencing diffusion bullet point portrays how to achieve the diffusion co the coefficient. The, for diffusion in semiconducting materials, which is incredibly impactful for this example, um, it results from a double heat treatment, which is separated into two parts. The first part is predisposition. During this process, impurity atoms are, are used in silicon or put into silicon at a temperature of around 900 to 1000 degrees Celsius. The second drive-in diffusion is when the impure atoms are driven further into the silicon. This results in better concentration of the impure atoms while simply not adding in more impurities. This process is orchestrated at a higher temperature of around 1200 degrees Celsius. 
These, process, these processes are helpful in terms of solar cells due to the need for efficient conductors. Without such diffusion, the photons will not freely move around necessary, the necessary amount to transmit beneficial power. For the graphics, we have the, the pink chart to the right basically shows the, the fill factor, which is how much output we have for energy versus our maximum output. And this is very impactful for engineers and scientists to basically increase the efficiency of certain solar cells and the impact they have in producing our power. There are a few concepts that are um, most important to this uh, to solar cells. The first is electron flux. Electron flux density helps explain that energy is related to the density and angle of approach of light. It's relevant for solar cells because light flow is what creates the magnetic field. It's ultimately responsible for power output. The amount of, uh, of electrical current that can be created is directly related to the uh, directional positioning of solar cells compared to the sun and the density of flux, kind of seen in the GIF um, of the sun and the solar cell. Um, for example, many solar cells rotate throughout the day to be perpendicular to the direction of light source to maximize power output. Additionally, diffusion is a type of flux which in solar cells helps enhance the ability to create magnetic fields. Also really important is junction depth, which comes from chapter six. Junction depth is important in determining which types of doping, uh, diffusion or ion implantation is, is appropriate, uh, which would create more current ultimately. Additionally, it's helpful in determining which the impure, uh, when the impurity concentration is equal to the background concentration of the impurity. It's, this is, again, useful for optimizing properties. Other important concepts of note are also in Chapter 6, um, and those include diffusion in semiconducting materials, impurities per unit area, and diffusion flux. An analysis of Chapter 6.6 .6 is useful. So when looking at the anatomy of the solar cell, we must first look at the basic parts to it. So for instance, crystalline silicon is used to the fact, due to the fact that its connections between each of the atoms form a crystal lattice. In turn, this makes the conversion of photons to electricity incredibly efficient. The four valence electrons which, which wish to bond com to complete the third shell and become stable. However, pure silicon is a poor conductor due to the fact that there is little free electrons moving around. As a result, to create solar cells, doping, usually with boron and phosphorus, is used to allow for more free electrons to be utilized. And the most important part of the entire solar cell is without the semiconductor layer, and this is formed from the n-type and p-type uh, semiconductors. So when using doping, we form the, these two semiconductor layers, which is the positive and the negative, boron being negative and phosphorus being positive, for an example. When these two conductors, semiconductors come into contact, an electrical field is formed. The flow of electrons eventually reaches equilibrium, and in turn, the electrical field acts as a, as a diode with electrons only flowing from the positive boron side to the negative phosphorus side. And you can see this illustrated through the black and gray uh, illustration on the bottom of the, uh, the slide. And another incredibly impactful aspect of the anatomy is the anti-reflective coating. With silicons being such a shiny and lustrous material, the photons will bounce off the surface, resulting in a loss of electrons. The anti-reflective coating is installed to mitigate these losses to basically boost efficiency and boost the amount of power that we get out of a certain solar cell. Another incredibly impactful aspect of the solar cell is the cover glass, which is kind of like a sealant on top of it to protect from outside elements such as rain. And when you'll hear more about these processes coming up. If a pure piece of silicon is surrounded by a gas containing boron or phosphorus and heated in a high temperature oven, the boron or phosphorus atoms will permeate the crystal lattice and displace some silicon atoms without disturbing other atoms in the vicinity. Due to the fact that boron atoms have only three electrons in their outermost electron shells, they can make bonds with only three of the silicon atoms surrounding them. This leaves the fourth silicon atom eager to fill its outermost electron shell. Thus, the location occupied by a boron atom in the silicone crystal will accept a free electron with relative ease and is therefore known as an acceptor, or in other words, a hole. Hole diffusion can be seen on the next slide. As can be seen, hole diffusion is what allows the solar energy to transfer between silicone type conductors in the top and bottom. Thank you for watching.